Yes. Well, that shows there was no white race. Right? I mean, and that solidarity testifies to it. And reading that leads to the question, well, how then and when did the white race come into being, and what purpose, for what purpose was it brought into being? Well, how did, how did it change? How did it come about? How was it invented? Well, I define racial oppression as a system under which the least, most degraded member of the oppressor group is exalted over any member of the oppressed group, however educated or uh, wealthy. And uh, what this came about in my argument here that in that the ruling class uh, was faced with a mass of dissatisfied, armed, poor people who made this rebellion, and they were put down, but they were still armed and they still dissatisfied, and uh, had to be uh, so they cast about for some means of maintaining social control. Now, in the first volume, you. Uh you give a lot of attention to Irish his history and Irish American history. What relevance does that have uh, to racial oppression? Well, I, I treat the uh, British uh, rule in Ireland in the early period, the 13th century, the 1200s, and then again after the Reformation in the 1560s uh, until uh, uh, and then most intensely after a couple of wars in the 18th century, the regime called Protestant Ascendancy. Protestant Ascendancy is like white supremacy. Under that law, uh, no Irish Catholic, no Irish Catholic could uh, own land, could uh, purchase, achieve, uh, uh, purchase land, could not rent for long periods of time, could not practice as a lawyer, and, and of course, could not vote, mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, uh, deprived of the elementary rights of Englishmen. Now, and all of them, not just the working uh, Catholics, you know, laboring class Catholics, but all Catholics of whatever class. So are uh, you saying that they took this type of oppression and they applied it to the African uh, Africans that were enslaved here? Well, what I'm saying is uh, uh, they overlapped some, uh, uh, well, particularly in the 18th century. And in the, the colonies in Virginia, in uh, a law was passed in 1723 that Negroes, Indians, and Catholics, Irish, uh, Irish Catholics, could not have the franchise. They couldn't vote. And uh, there were, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a thing that indicates the kinship of the two systems. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in the continental colonies, in uh, plantation colonies, Virginia and Maryland, where they started, uh, the motive for it didn't depend upon what had happened in Ireland. They here they were just as in Ireland they were confronted with the pro problem of social control, and so they used the Protestant versus Catholic system. Here, to maintain Protestant, uh, maintain social control, the ruling class here, the plantation bourgeoisie, uh, uh, established a rule in which they sought to enlist all. European Americans as whites in the system of control, even though they themselves were poor and downtrodden themselves. Now, in your second volume, I think the point is driven home uh, uh, even more so about how the systems of oppression were different between the uh, uh, the slavery in the British West Indies and the slavery on uh, continental America. And I think maybe an explanation uh, would help explain the difference in the racial oppression there compared to here. 
Yes, that's a very, very important aspect uh, of uh, this uh, treatment of the subject because uh, it, if it is said that, well, as some historians apparently assume or say, well, there's a natural tendency of the whites to dominate, right? Yeah, but now in the West Indies, it had something to do with the numbers, right? Yes, they in the West Indies, in in, in a characteristic of the United States, uh, Anglo America, uh, continental Anglo America, was the denial of social mobility to African Americans, free African Americans, uh, not just bond laborers, but the free African Americans were denied. Uh, the rights of citizens, and at one time in Virginia in 1693, I think it was, they passed a law saying uh, the free Negroes, persons who freed Negroes must pay for their transportation out of the colony. In other words, to keep down free Negroes as well as bond laborers. So, if, in the Americas, if you if you had one ounce of African blood, you were considered African American, yeah. and you could not move up the social ladder because of the African blood that flowed through your brain, yeah. your, your your veins. But in the yeah. uh, British and that West was Indies, done, but yeah, now that was, and in in the West Indies, after a certain period, all, almost beginning uh, even before the 18th century, the ruling class there, the British ruling class, was recruiting some persons of one degree or another of African ancestry into the middle strata, in the militia, and, and uh, in uh, petty trades, and they became uh, important uh, in the merchandising of, you know, not of the sugar crop, but of other things. And, uh, uh, and they became landowners, and they became owners of bond laborers themselves. So they were allowed to move up the social yes, they chain. Were, they, yes, they had to allow that because there was no way of controlling the Negroes, as they said it, and, and this is formulated in my book. I mean, I have a pages where I cite several of the English authors who say we need to promote the mulatto and some blacks to uh, an intermediate strata, so they will be on our side, on the side of the whites, mm -hmm. and that works pretty well uh, for uh, a long time. And the heritage of it is seen today in Europe, uh, West Indian immigrants who have come here already experienced in functioning in the petty bourgeois strata of society, whereas in the United States that was considered an affront to the poor whites to have a Negro uh, be a merchant or be a, a supervisor or anything of that sort. And, but there the difference is this that in the West Indies, the British West Indies, there were too few European Americans to recruit the sufficient middle class, intermediate social control stratum, whereas in continental Anglo-American colonies, Virginia, Maryland, elsewhere, there were too many European Americans to be recruited into that right, so class, so they promoted them to what? The white race. race. So the white race is uh, particularly unique to continental uh, slavery as yeah. opposed to the British uh, West Indy and uh, slavery. Now, is, what hope do you have uh, for anyone who reads your book? What is, what is your hope? Um, how would they take something like this and uh, use it in their lives today? How, how would well, I would hope first that any reader will read critically. You know, and test what is said there. And they well, does it hang together? You know? Yes, and it is, uh, it is uh, very well documented, I must yeah, say. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, footnotes and nice things, and some of them are uh, substantive, not, and they need uh, to be given attention. Uh, so read it critically. And then I hope that it may be found a contribution to 
strengthening the struggle in, uh, against white supremacy. Okay, now the music that you hear is uh, called Points, Re uh, Facts, and Reasons. And I think it's uh, an appropriate song for today's show because you've made a lot of points, you've stated a lot of facts, and you've given a lot of reasons. And I, I really uh, appreciate uh, you uh, coming here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Theodore Allen uh, can be uh, reached at uh, Verso Publishing at 180 Varick Street. And uh, he has an email address. What's your email address? TWAllen1 at ix.netcom.com. .com, okay. And, uh,